research of the central nervous system complications of chronic infections including HIV, HCV and CMV. He leads cohort studies and clinical trials that focus on central nervous system infections as well as pharmacokinetics of antiretroviral drugs. Uh, the neurological effects of uh, comorbidities and biomarker correlates of the disease. And uh, over to you, Dr. Scott Littender. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm not going to talk about very much about the brain. Uh, I'll fit in a few comments about it, but I'm going to talk mostly about premature aging and people with HIV. And with Dr. Pawa in the audience, it's always uh, a bit challenging because she is uh, uh, very knowledgeable in this area. So, uh, but I'll do my best to try to uh, cover some of the information. Uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, this is uh, the nature of the problem, right? So the integrase inhibitors, the protease inhibitors, um, all of these uh, combination drugs are extending people's lives, and that's uh, great. And that's what this graph on the left shows is the change in the distribution in different decades of life uh, now and as uh, we move uh, projected mo moving into the future. Uh, and with these uh, therapies, uh, people are living longer, and so survival is improving uh, from 1996 to 2000 to 2005 to 2006 to 2014. But you can see that there is still a uh, gap uh, that's being narrowed, but there's still a gap between people with HIV and uh, the general population. And so uh, when we look for evidence of premature aging, we, we find it in almost every organ system. And again, we focus on the nervous system, but if you look at the vascular system, at the endocrine and metabolic sy system, the liver, the kidney, the musculoskeletal system, the lungs, and so on, um, we find uh, evidence of it in, in every organ. And uh, we know that people with HIV, even when their HIV is controlled, they uh, are still at increased risk for non-AIDS associated malignancies. So these are all indicators. And when people with HIV uh, get these conditions, they not only get them earlier than uninfected people, but they get more than one. They get more of them uh, than the general population. So this is a very nice analysis from Judith Shouten showing a number of these conditions, increased risk in HIV positive people. But this is uh, one of several publications that show uh, the number of these conditions, the multimorbidity that people with HIV have compared with uninfected people. So again, these conditions occur in almost every organ, they can occur. Uh, they, uh, people with HIV are more likely to have them. They occur earlier in life uh, than in the general population. And when they have them, they have typically, they're more likely to have more than one than the general population. So uh, this multimorbidity uh, is sort of a, a way of thinking about multiple conditions, a composite condition, if you will. And another one of these that occurs in people as they get older is frailty. So Linda Freed from Johns Hopkins uh, um, formulated this approach to defining frailty uh, back in the early 2000s in people in the general population. And this, di this uh, approach to diagnosing frailty as well as others have been uh, 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 applied to people with HIV as well. And it's a very useful uh, uh, concept. It involves several constructs, uh, basically chronic undernutrition, which occurs in people as they get older, loss of muscle mass, which we call sarcopenia, a reduced metabolic uh, uh, rate, and uh, reduced total en energy expenditure. So as a result, people lose weight, they're undernourished, they have uh, lower muscle mass, and they fall more easily. And so frailty has been linked to disability, to comorbidities, to falls, and other things that occur in people as they get older. And um, these are the components of the frailty phenotype, and you see the distribution here of the number of components of this frailty phenotype, and linking it to uh, uh, mortality and morbidity in, outside of HIV. And again, people have done this within HIV as well. And uh, not only is, uh, the, are, do people have more conditions uh, and, and frailty, but then they're on more medications for these conditions as well. 
So polypharmacy is uh, increasingly recognized as a contributor to these processes because they can not only interact with uh, our HIV drugs that we're giving people, but they can, uh, obviously can have side effects as well, including important side effects for the brain like anticholinergic side effects. And so in this very nice uh, and frequently referenced uh, publication, you can see the number of concomitant medications that people are on, again, projected forward into uh, 2020, 2030, and so on, uh, based on uh, uh, data from an existing cohort. And the most common medications are cardiovascular medications, diabetes medications, and osteoporosis medications. And again, people can be on multiple of these. And, and our charter cohort, I'm not showing you these data, but we have people, the average number of other medications that our participants are on is eight. And we have people who are on 15 other medications, 20 other medications than their HIV medications. And that could be symptomatic of the American healthcare system to some degree, uh, the problems with the American healthcare system. Uh, but it, it is a problem elsewhere also. So there's sort of this uh, idea about how this premature aging occurs. And of course, it starts with the virus. And uh, uh, there's been mention of the gut microbiome and injury of the gut that occurs early in HIV infection. And we think this may be important in this process as well, because as you know, uh, when the gut is injured by HIV, uh, there's uh, microbial translocation. So bacteria, yeast, their byproducts uh, more easily get into the bloodstream where they can cause a number of effects, including uh, inflammation, so uh, damage to the lymphoid system, uh, persistent immune activation, and then liver dysfunction as well, which we don't talk about very much, but liver, the liver is one of the most commonly affected organs uh, by aging in, the, in anyone, and including in people with HIV, and yet it's a critically important organ. And then uh, this leads to uh, uh, monocyte macrophage activation, another condition we don't talk about much in our patients, but altered coagulation as well. This is also very important. And these combine, uh, these conditions combine, we think, to lead to, uh, to increase risk for atherosclerosis and vascular disease, as well as leading to this multimorbidity and premature aging that we think we're seeing. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about CMV, but we're very interested not only in the gut microbiome, but also in the effect of CMV. As you know, this is a, a herpes family virus. It integrates its DNA into our cells. It repeatedly uh, reactivates typically throughout life when people have it. And in the general population in the U.S., about 40 to 60 percent of people are infected with CMV, but among people with HIV, because CMV is, is uh, passed by the same mechanisms that HIV is, 100%, uh, virtually 100% of people have CMV. And it has, it has a number of effects in, in addition to depleting naive uh, T cells, uh, leading to uh, having uh, differentiated, a larger pool of differentiated memory T cells and a smaller pool of uh, naive T cells, which is one of the definitions of immune senescence. So I'm not going to talk about very much about immune senescence. Dr. Pawa is particularly expert in, in that area. But we think CMV may be important not only by increasing inflammation and, and, and increasing the risk of progression to immune senescence in combination with HIV, but um, by other mechanisms that ultimately lead to worse health outcomes. And there actually are new drugs uh, being developed uh, for CMV now. So uh, all of that's nice. We can talk about these other conditions, but some people want to see evidence of biological aging. So can we look at cells and can we actually see that some indicators of cellular senescence or biological aging are worse in people with HIV? And so this is uh, an analysis that we recently presented at Croy. Sanjay Mehta from UCSD uh, uh, performed some very nice analyses. And it's from our HIV and methamphetamine cohort. And Sanjay very nicely showed that the telomere length mapped here against age was uh, shorter in people uh, with any of these conditions, either being a methamphetamine user without HIV 
HIV without using methamphetamine or both conditions. And that, the, these, uh, these lines here show those people, whereas the blue line are the HIV negative methamphetamine non-users, the control population. So you can see this difference uh, uh, between these lines uh, in uh, the telomere length uh, across the age spectrum. And we calculated just using regression uh, equations, compared with this control population, what the uh, age deficit was, in a way, if, uh, for having one of these conditions relative to a 40-year-old person who had neither of them. So if uh, compared with a 40-year-old person who's uh, HIV negative and a methamphetamine non-user, if you use methamphetamine, your telomeres are equivalent to someone who's 55. If you have HIV but don't use methamphetamine, uh, 56, and if you have both conditions, your telomeres uh, are equivalent to a 60, uh, almost 61-year-old person from the general population. So uh, th these are interesting data. Not all of the telomere data are consistent in HIV, so I should say that. Uh, uh, Rita Efros from UCLA has, has been generating telomere data uh, in T cells since before I uh, entered the field uh, back in the 90s, she was publishing on this. So some of the data are supportive, but uh, not all of it. Um, other people have said, well, you know, telomere length is uh, a measurement is fraught uh, with errors, a difficult method. It's been improved over time, but it used to be more difficult. Um, it doesn't relate to many things besides cancer risk. So maybe there are better ways of estimating uh, biological aging. And Steve Horvath and Andy Levine, also at UCLA, up in Los Angeles, north of us, um, have looked at something called, they call the epigenetic clock. They use a DNA methylation array that they uh, use with an algorithm that they've developed to estimate the, the age of a cell. And so using this method uh, that they think is better than the telomere length, they've uh, compared HIV negative and HIV positive populations and have um, calculated that, uh, in this case, blood cells seem to be about five years older based on DNA methylation, the epigenetic clock, uh, in people with HIV than people without HIV. So this is another uh, 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 type of evidence of biological aging that supports that idea, but this hasn't been confirmed by anyone. And then another indicator, biological indicator, is called P16 INC4A. It's a marker of cellular senescence, and uh, this is a uh, nice analysis that was published in 2016 that looks at several groups of people. Uh, I apologize, abbreviations are not entirely obvious, but the HC are HIV negative controls, HS are HIV suppressed on ART, uh, and then they looked at HIV controllers off a ART, HIV non-controllers off ART, and immunologic progressors off of ART. And what this graph is showing is that, um, that this indicator of cellular senescence seems to normalize in CD4 cells when people are on ART, so that's good news. It looks more like the control population when people are on, um, on a, a ART, but the CD8 cells do not. So the CD8 cells may be senescing uh, uh, more quickly, or at least they're not returning towards a normal level when people are on ART. And there are other publications in this, uh, with this indicator, this biomarker as well, and they're not all consistent, but this is one where there is a signal. So, okay. Um, I'll fix this. Okay. So what about, uh, so, so those are indicators of biological aging. Let's talk a little bit about these conditions that seem to occur more frequently in people with HIV. So metabolic syndrome, I think, is a very important and central one. And there's a number of different definitions uh, that uh, can be used to uh, calculate an, uh, a measure that says whether someone has metabolic syndrome or not. And which one you use is up to you, but essentially they include elements of obesity, insulin resistance, lipids, and blood pressure. So all of them do, they have some somewhat different thresholds, and again, you can choose which one you prefer, but these are the conditions that are probably important. And when uh, a number of studies have uh, looked at uh, the increased risk of metabolic syndrome in people with HIV, 
and this is one meta-analysis that did so. And uh, you can see uh, that uh, they stratified people by whether they were taking ART or not taking ART. And among people who were off ART, um, people with HIV had about a 12% increased risk of having metabolic syndrome uh, versus uh, if they were on ART, about 18%. So the overall uh, prevalence varied by definition. Uh, this isn't, I'm sorry, this is not increased, this is just the prevalence. So the pr overall prevalence varied by definition, but between 17% and 31% of people uh, with HIV had metabolic syndrome. So that's not an inconsequential um, uh, uh, proportion of people. And as we know, uh, some of the drugs seem to, uh, uh, to uh, particularly predispose people to metabolic syndrome and diabetes and insulin resistance. So uh, if we look at diabetes, uh, um, people who were on therapy had a, almost a fourfold increase odds of having diabetes when they were taking ART. And the drugs that we know uh, are most strongly associated with these risks are the protease inhibitors and the NNRTIs. And to follow on with, uh, with uh, Rami's uh, presentation, the integrase inhibitors, you can see, don't seem to have as much of an effect uh, as uh, these other classes of drugs. So um, with the protease inhibitors, there's some nice data looking at carotid artery wall thickness. Uh, with longer duration of protease inhibitor therapy associated with thicker carotid walls, and also here with darunavir being associated with faster progression of uh, carotid intimate media thickness uh, than uh, atazanavir. So we know protease inhibitors are associated with uh, uh, evidence of vascular disease, and, and there's a number of studies that have looked at various indicators of uh, vascular disease, in this case myocardial infarctions, showing in a fairly large study that um, across uh, all of the ages here, the age ranges, the, the uh, decades of life, that people with HIV have an increased risk of, uh, of uh, myocardial infarction compared with the, uh, the general population with the hazard ratio overall being about 1.5. Uh, Felicia Chow has also looked at stroke risk. Other people have as well, other investigators. Felicia's focused on uh, HIV-infected women here. And what this is showing is the hazard ratio either in an unadjusted model or in models that adjust for increasing number of factors. And you can see even in a fully adjusted model, the risk for stroke among women uh, with HIV is almost, uh, the hazard is almost twofold greater than the general population. And again, the bars are reversed here with the HIV positive women coming first compared with the prior um, uh, graph. But again, you can see that this, uh, uh, this risk seems to carry through um, all decades of life. So again, we're interested in neurocognitive impairments, so I'll just quickly say that uh, uh, we, we and others have found evidence that insulin resistance and diabetes and vascular disease all seem to uh, be linked with cognitive problems, not just in Charter, but also in the SMART study. In the START study as well, you can see here diabetes, sorry for the small text, but this is the diabetes effect, a fairly strong effect. And then also looking at uh, tertiles of uh, HOMA IR, an indicator of insulin resistance, in the WISE study, uh, stepwise worsening in neurocognitive performance, interestingly, only in the HIV positive women. So that tells us that there may be other factors at play here as well. Um, in addition to looking at cognition, we can look at things like white matter injury. Uh, when we compare HIV positive people to HIV negative people, we see that the HIV positive people seem to be at risk for developing abnormal white matter, uh, larger volumes of abnormal white matter as they get older than the general population. And uh, this was a charter finding that uh, hasn't been published yet, but uh, someone else has found a similar finding from the University of Florida, Ron Cohen's group, uh, very similar, uh, that uh, white matter hyperintensities increase more with age with HIV positive people than with HIV negative people. And this can be an indicator of vascular disease. 
We're also interested in blood-brain barrier permeability, and uh, these are very interesting findings uh, comparing CSF serum albumin ratio, an indicator of blood-brain barrier permeability, to things uh, to components of the metabolic syndrome, cholesterol, glucose, blood pressure, and finding links with all four of these indicators, these components of metabolic syndrome with blood-brain barrier permeability, and when we put them all together into a composite measure using multivariate regression, you can see a, a fairly nice association here between this uh, uh, predicted value and the actual value. And this might be important because when we compare CSF to serum albumin ratio to the CSF plasma ratio of drugs like lopinavir or favarins, there are statistically significant uh, correlations between them. And so um, uh, if you have metabolic syndrome, you uh, may have greater blood-brain barrier permeability. You may be delivering more antiretroviral drugs and other drugs to the central nervous system, which could have benefits for controlling HIV, but it could also lead to greater toxicity. So uh, finally, another drug indicator, this is from Croy this year. Um, uh, these investigators were interested in the idea uh, of the effect of, uh, of aging on uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And this was because they knew that the pool of endogenous uh, uh, nucleosides and nucleotides uh, tends to decrease with age, and yet the, uh, the, uh, the enzymes involved in uh, exogenous nucleosides and nucleotides and phosphorylating those and making the active forms of things like FTC and tenofovir uh, continue on at the same level or may even increase with age. So their hypothesis is that older people would have higher ratios of the uh, phosphorylated drug to the, uh, to the uh, endogenous nucleoside uh, for FTC and tenofovir, and that's what they found. And so these are statistically significant differences. You can see that uh, this is a log scale, but they're not very large differences, so it's hard to know um, what this means. Does this mean that there might be more cellular toxicity from uh, these drugs as people get older? Possibly, but more, more work needs to be done. And then finally, uh, one other uh, note I'll make is about uh, uh, with premature aging is that the mechanisms may differ between men and women. So uh, uh, th this again is sort of focused on, uh, on the brain, but estrogen has neuroprotective effects. So uh, as women get older, its loss may increase neuronal vulnerability to injury. Uh, there's also some studies showing that women have lower antioxidant levels, and we know oxidative stress is important in uh, all organs uh, with HIV and inflammation. Insulin resistance is more common in women, has been linked to cognitive impairment in women, and women may be more likely to have altered iron metabolism, which can affect a number of organs, including the brain. So what can we do? Well. Uh, there's uh, not a lot of uh, specific therapies for aging, uh, wish there were, but at this point uh, there's no magic pill for aging. But, you know, we can generally lead a healthier life, encourage our patients to exercise and lose weight and stop smoking, and Brian Chan will talk about that, uh, moderate their alcohol use, and perhaps alter the microbiome. Uh, we have to be very mindful of uh, polypharmacy, so looking at the, carefully at the, the prescribed and unprescribed drugs that they're taking. Uh, we can also target components of the metabolic syndrome. So I believe that uh, um, uh, Connie or uh, Connie Benson or uh, uh, Kumar or both told me that uh, you're participating in the reprieve study here in Chennai. Uh, metformin may also be a useful drug, treat co-infections like hepatitis C, and then there's a number of adjunctive therapies that people are looking at for the brain. Um, we know this, but this is an, a, a specific HIV positive population, but really shows you know, this beautiful stair step effect for myocardial infarction and cardiovascular disease uh, based on the duration of smoking cessation that people have. So you know, again, just very nice visual and highly statistically significant evidence that people who stop smoking uh, have benefits uh, uh, for their cardiovascular system. Uh, this is sort of a busy slide, but I'm just going to quickly summarize that uh, um, 
you know, that exercise, there's evidence that exercise has benefits in people with HIV on cognitive functioning, uh, better control of, of insulin resistance of diabetes uh, may also have benefits. Uh, this is a study of probiotics where they uh, gave people a probiotic product here without the probiotic, here with the probiotic, and you can see that the level of uh, T cell activation measured by CD8 CD38 and HLA-DR uh, improved uh, and, and was not different after the administration of the probiotic from uh, controls. Uh, these, all these people were on suppressive antiretroviral therapy. Um, I'll hop over here and just talk about uh, tobacco smoke. Um, I didn't know this, that smoking increases the risk for metabolic syndrome. So this was, uh, I think, very interesting. But ETS here is environmental tobacco smoke. So these are non-smokers who, who have uh, secondhand smoke, who get exposed to tobacco smoke. And, uh, and this includes me as a child. Both of my parents smoked until they were about 45. So children who get exposed to uh, tobacco smoke um, have an increased risk of developing um, insulin resistance and diabetes later in life. And I'll end with this because this is uh, uh, interesting and sort of humorous uh, uh, study. So this was uh, a study looking at insulin resistance. So they took people who had uh, insulin resistance and, uh, and it's based on their microbiome. So they wanted to see whether or not changing their, their gut microbiome would have a benefit on insulin resistance. And so they did fecal transplants on them. And to compare, to, to de determine what better whether or not giving someone a transplant, a fecal transplant from another person was actually beneficial, they first gave them a fecal transplant from themselves. So here uh, you've got uh, two groups where they gave people their own stool and there was no difference in insulin sensitivity, but here they gave them someone else's stool. Uh, so they gave them uh, the, stool, the stool fecal transplant from someone who had normal insulin sensitivity and was lean, and their insulin sensitivity improved. And so, uh, you know, more needs to be done. It's a little uh, uncomfortable, I think, sometimes to talk about uh, fecal transplant, but uh, there there's really seems to be something to be learned here. So there's evidence of premature aging that exists in persons living with HIV, uh, but the data are not entirely consistent and we have to understand why. Uh, and there's clinical data, biological data, pharmacological data to support this. The roles of disease severity and antiretroviral therapy should become more clear with time, particularly as more people get transitioned off of protease inhibitors and NNRTIs. And distinguishing the effects of HIV from syndemic conditions is really critically important. Our patients tend to have so many other factors that can increase aging, worsen aging. We really have to be very careful about separating the effect of HIV from the effect of other conditions like methamphetamine use or other drugs of abuse and other, other conditions they may have, other infections. So uh, there's definitional issues here and, uh, and so on. So um, I'll stop there. Um, sorry, got too many controls. All right, so acknowledgments, uh, particularly uh, Pearl and Dr. Kumarasamy, uh, they are been very supportive. Uh, it's unfortunate that Chip and Connie couldn't be here this year, uh, but uh, we all miss them. And then Dr. Barty is here in the first, uh, first row as well and has uh, been a great colleague as well. So thank you very much.